So, why is music not a hobby? Well, music can be a hobby, but it's not a hobby of mine. <laughs> and maybe 10 years ago, I wouldn't be able to answer it as well. But basically, you have to perform well under any condition. The environmental condition, your own physical, emotional condition. You have to work it out with people, no matter how much you like them. You have to do whatever it takes to make a successful, engaging performance, no matter how much you like the piece yourself. You have to show up on time, no matter what travel karma fails you. And no matter how much you don't feel like practicing, if that is what takes to make your performance successful, you do it day after day. Why have you chosen chamber music as your focus? I fell in love with chamber music when I was in school. Like I just, I, I love everything about it. I love playing it, love studying it and learning about it. I love the way chamber music makes musicians interact with each other. I mean, I just love all of it. Well, so because I know you, uh, I'm gonna have to ask you, what is this love to you? Well, it, it's love is love, you know, it's, it's something that makes you possibly be willing to accept whatever it comes with, you know, and it's to, this love is to accept a balance it comes with. How about that? So then you've chosen a career in chamber music or chamber music has chosen you? Uh, neither. <laughs> I wouldn't say I've chosen uh, chamber music as a career. I pursued chamber music as a career because I loved it. So I wanted to give it a try and it's very difficult. So I've always thought to myself, I'm going to give it a try, do whatever it takes. And if it works out that I can make a living doing it, then I will do it. And if I can't make a living doing it, then, um, then I will get a job job, you know? And, and I think I'm just very fortunate that it worked out. I mean, it's not like a generous living. It's a it's a modest living, but it's a it's an okay living. And well, I mean, before the pandemic, I think there was an updated answer to this question: whether I can make a living doing doing chamber music. But the pandemic's only temporary. Is it, or is it temporary enough, or is it temporary enough for someone like me? What skill I get to offer, the quality of my skill, is is it worth? holding out for, you know, to not being able to make a living for so long. And let's just say, if the answer to that is yes, my skill is worth holding out for, then, um, well, like many people have told me, people that, um, that are experts, you know, people that I admire, or people that are um, patrons that love music. But right now, with nobody patronizing music performances and, and musicians, I don't know if the words are enough. Maybe it's not worth holding out for. You know, I, I ask myself this every day. And despite of all these people that say it's worth it or, or the people that say they love music, they don't go to concerts themselves. Are you seriously reading from the floor? Yes. Why don't you just pick it up? I could. I mean, your, your, your practice station looks like a bit of a war zone here. Well, you know, I don't really need the music most of the time because I, you know, how I'm supposed to do it is already in my head, but, um, I mean, it used to be on the stand. <laughs> but the other day I was teaching and I think the power went out or something and then so I grabbed my computer because I was like running to you like, honey, the internet's broken. And then um, I think I didn't realize, I mean, why wouldn't I realize, but the computer was still uh, attached to the power. <laughs> so when I dragged it and then a lot of things all just fell. And then so some of the things managed to stay on like here and then, but then a lot of things just fell in and I, um, 
Well, since I don't really need most of them, so I just accept it where they they decide to be. <laughs> accept it where they decide to be. <laughs> Well, you know, I think it's a it's a life lesson. You know, sometimes things just happen or become a certain way, and and I'm practicing not letting it get to me and be flexible. <laughs> but I mean, from what I know about you, your practicing is not really disorganized at all. Like your station seems to be. Well, don't be deceived by my station. My practicing is extremely organized. I mean, like what I always teach my students, like every spot, every passage, I sort of have.、Um, I have my own archival information. You know, like it's like color coded, difficulty coded, ready coded, and how it is in terms of、um, rhythm, intonation, musicality, and sound quality. All of that, like I know where they are, and there is a, a very, very clear list in there. So, you know, it's not the station that matters. So, is this、uh, what you're playing this weekend? Whatever this is. Oh, not at all, not at all. <laughs> this piece is not ready.、Um, it's probably for maybe a couple weeks from now, two weeks, maybe three weeks.、Um, but yeah, I mean, some some pieces will just take much longer. Actually, most of the pieces I don't just practice for a week and perform. So I basically like I have to aim for a certain date and then back up the amount of time I need, and then I just you know, like I said, with my organization of where things are. I build toward performing. So, well, if it's ready, like in two weeks, I'll play. Three weeks, I'll play. Not ready, I'll play in a year. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Let's document my biggest accomplishment today.、Um, I call this pile king. <laughs> It's the biggest one among the eight other ones I made today. But I think I made about maybe. Thirty, forty in the past few weeks. How much do you think they're worth? I mean, not the leaves, the raking of the piles. People would probably pay for raking more than they would pay for music these days. I was talking to a friend the other day, and he said, "You know, we were talking about certain jobs and what they make, and at some point he was like." I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> I know, musicians, we're all doing it wrong, especially these days. I mean, this is probably worth more than we are right now. But I can think of it with my father's logic. He would think that instead of paying somebody, if I had raked myself, it would be as if I made the money. That I didn't pay somebody, so I made all this money raking today, right? What else do we have these days except our sense of humor? Oh yeah, and each other. You and Murphy. Sorry. <laughs> So the piece I'm playing is "Returning Soul" by Shi Hui Chen, and she's a Taiwanese composer that lives in Texas. So my
There were more people there this week. You seem happy about that. I was very happy that there were people to listen. How did you feel when people were there? Well, I think I was speaking more in my music and in my words to people. And, um, you know, I, maybe I was expressing more and delivering more. Um, but of course, if nobody's there, I try to recreate that speaking quality um, as if, you know, because ultimately we're in charge, we're responsible for the quality of our performance. And so I would try to recreate it, but I could just feel that I was speaking much more to people in my music and words. So what do you think this speaking is? I don't know if I can answer perfectly with like measured, gathered data, but um, it probably is a combination of things that we, we learn growing up in music, um, what makes a performance more engaging or more successful. Um, I can probably imagine and like, you know, like when you're watching a movie and there are scenes that the character is in danger or suspenseful or maybe it's very touching and or there's a scene that opens up and then people are supposed to feel like it's grand or it's breathtaking. And so people's emotions are taken with those scenes and what happens in the movie. And so that's probably like what we're doing, you know, we're, we're not about the accomplishment of people thinking we're good or, or thinking we can play the violin very well. It's more about taking people on this emotional journey with us. And I would probably relate it to more, uh, more like storytelling. Imagine if you are like a professional storyteller and you can probably, you know, do with perfect diction and um, inflection and, and, and do all the things you're supposed to do but that's probably a completely different story than if you were actually telling the stories to giggling children that are fascinated by what's happening in the story. So, yeah, so we're probably like storytellers. Like we're, we're very much about taking people on this emotional journey, like I said earlier. So you can sense how people are feeling when you're playing? Mm. Yes, no, yes. I don't know. I mean, both, neither. <laughs> I don't know. But I definitely feel different when people are there, when there's people to play for.